I'm Michelle Cavagelli, as you've probably learned by now, but I'm in Beltsville, and I put a bunch of other names on here because the research I'm going to show you sometimes was led by other people, or uh, in any case, if it was led by me, there was lots of other help to get this done. It does take quite a bit of hands to get this stuff done. <clears throat> Can you guys see the screens okay? Okay, because I've never looked at a screen here and not seen the screen I'm talking at. <laughs> so I'm not a professor. So. <laughs> Anyway, so um, you all know this, you know, that the, probably the two primary tools that we have as organic farmers, and I'm not an organic farmer, but I manage organic research, which is a similar type of prospect, is legume cover crops for the nitrogen and poultry litter or other manures for other nutrients in addition to nitrogen, right? And if you rely just on cover crops, legume cover crops, you're not getting any new phosphorus into the system. So you need some form of phosphorus to balance what you're selling of phosphorus. Poultry litter by itself or other manures by themselves generally have too much phosphorus, a lot of nitrogen, you get this phosphorus buildup. You guys know all the, I'll know the story, right? So the question is, can we blend the two to get the benefits of the nitrogen from the legume and get the phosphorus from the poultry litter in our case? and not overload the system with phosphorus, but get enough nitrogen and enough phosphorus at the same time. <clears throat> so I do run this long-term farming systems project. It's called the Farming Systems Project, in fact. It's got five different cropping systems. I'm just showing you the organic systems here. And this was very interesting to me this morning, the talk about the length of the rotations, because we Uniquely in the United States, I actually have three different organic cropping systems. I think it's the only long-term trial that has that. And so we have a relatively short rotation of just two years. It's a corn-soybean rotation, but you see actually five crop or four crops in there, right? Because after the corn, we plant rye cover crop. And after the soybean, we plant a vetch and rye mixture to get some of the nitrogen back for the corn that we're going to come back to again. Then we have a three-year rotation, which is the same as the two-year rotation, except we throw in wheat in there. So that's doing a lot of things in that you're adding a winter annual instead of a summer annual. <clears throat> but it also gives you a better chance to establish the vetch rye cover crop at this point. Because in the two-year rotation, you know, sometimes we're harvesting our soybeans in October or November. Not the best time to start and get a good cover crop established. Then the six-year rotation is more traditional for may maybe a dairy, <clears throat> corn, rye, soybean, wheat. So that's the same as the three-year rotation, but then we had three years of alfalfa, so we get six years. And then on the, I guess that's the right for you too, right? On the right-hand side, I kind of have a typical poultry litter application rate. That's for the whole rotation. So that's, in the two-year rotation, we're adding about two tons of poultry litter to the corn, that's why the corn's in yellow, and we're doing that every other year, so the average is one ton per acre per year, right? <clears throat> so you can see that we have a different rate, typical uh, poultry litter application rates, and the highest rate is really in the three-year rotation. So we're getting more phosphorus inputs in our three-year rotation than we are in our two-year rotation <clears throat> than we are in our six-year rotation. So that's just something to keep in mind, uh, both for the next slide, but I'll come, I'll circle back to this project at the very end. <clears throat> so what have we learned from the organic research at the FSP? And here I'm just comparing the three-year organic rotation because we also have some three-year conventional rotations. So what we've learned is that we get less predicted soil erosion in this organic system because we have more cover crops, essentially. It's all due to the cover crops. It's not because it's organic by nature, but because we have more cover crops. We've also decreased fossil fuel use by 21% <clears throat> over the, you know, the span of the rotation. And we've improved soil health, soil organic carbon, potentially mineralizable nitrogen, particulate organic matter, all different forms of organic matter that are critical for fertility and recycling your nutrients. And so all that soil health benefits also give you some soil fertility benefits. But there's some challenges. <clears throat> As I'm kind of implied already, we're increasing our soil test phosphorus in this rotation. And we've done it by about 32% over about 10 years. So that's something we need to pay attention to. So really, we're putting, two, we're putting more phosphorus in than we're taking out. All right, so that's an issue that you guys are dealing with as well. Uh, who knows what N2O is? This is, this is the part where I'm going to quiz you later. Is that nitrite? N2O is nitrous oxide. 
Nitrous oxide is a gas. It's one of those three greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that are increasing CO2, N2O, and methane. N2O is one of them. Agriculture is the primary source of it. So the reason I have it here, though, so we do measure that. I'm not going to talk about that here. But if you're getting a lot of N2O, it's, it's an indication that you might have too much nitrogen at the wrong time in your system. All soils produce N2O, but some produce more than others. So this is an indication that we might have too much uh, nitrogen in the system. Another really obvious one is <clears throat> we plant some nodulating soybeans right next to some non-nodulating soybeans for research purposes to measure nitrogen fixation by soybeans. <clears throat> if you have a lot of soil, soil nitrogen, soybeans is going to say, ah, I'm not going to fix nitrogen. I'm just going to take the nitrogen from the soil because that's cheaper than me having to give some of my carbon to the bacteria that do the nitrogen fixation in my roots. So if you have a lot of soil nitrogen, your soybeans don't fix as much nitrogen. So if you have a nodulating soybean, and I should have put a picture of this up. If you have a nodulating soybean, you know, it's dark green, tall. If you have a non-nodulating soybean in a typical soil, it's short, yellow, and very different because it's just not getting the, the, enough nitrogen from the soil. Well, in our organic systems, our nodulating and non-nodulating soybeans right next to each other look about the same. They're both dark green. <clears throat> so that means that the one that's not nodulating, so that means it can't fix its own nitrogen, but it's getting all its nitrogen from the soil. Our non-nodulating soybean is dark green. That means there's plenty of nitrogen in, this, in these organically managed soils. <clears throat> so it looks actually that we have probably too much phosphorus and too much nitrogen. So what we decided to do then was do some side projects to try to address these management issues that we're having in this long-term project, because we heard from all you guys 10 years ago, if not more, that you're having some of these same issues, especially with the phosphorus. <clears throat> so this suggests that we can improve nitrogen and phosphorus management. So what are the options? What, what can we do to balance these two nitrogen and phosphorus inputs that we have, the cover crops and the uh, manures? <clears throat> Well, corn, as you probably all know, takes up most of its nitrogen, not right away, but after, it starts really taking up nitrogen after about 30 days. And so in the conventional world, people are trying to increase nitrogen use efficiency of fertilizers or nutrient use efficiency of any fertilizer. And they talk about the right source at the right rate with the right timing and the right placement. You guys have all heard this type of stuff? It's just kind of standard. <clears throat> So we figured we could use this type of thinking to manage our organic systems. <clears throat> There's limited research on this, really, but we have different sources. We already talked about that. We have legumes. We have manure. We also have animal byproducts, like feather meal, that might be used in organic systems. Obviously, we can change the rate of application of anything. And for timing, most organic farmers plant, uh, apply at planting or before planting. But maybe we could also side dress in organic systems. Would that help us increase? Maybe we can apply things at a lower rate, at a better time for corn and uptake. <clears throat> so we explored some of that. And then placement is another option where we can broadcast the manure, which is pretty standard in managing manure in general. But there's some new technologies looking at injecting and banding. I'm actually not going to talk about that in this talk, just for time's sake. And that's a little bit more kind of cutting edge in that the equipment isn't necessarily available broadly at this point yet. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about four different experiments. And I'm just going to summarize what our findings are from these experiments. <clears throat> and the first experiment, we varied both the source and the timing of our nitrogen sources. The second experiment, we varied the source, the rate, and the timing. The third experiment, we just looked at source. The fourth experiment, we're now looking at rate. And I'll, talk, I'll walk you through each of those experiments and show you what we found. So the first one was looking at different sources of animal byproducts that are available here in Maryland. Because we have a, a chicken industry, there's poultry litter, obviously, that many people use. There's also pelletized poultry litter. We heard somebody this morning <coughs> mention that they use that on the former panel. There's feather meal as an option. And there's also this blend, which I don't know if this is still available now, but a blend of feather meal and pelletized poultry litter. <clears throat> These products have different amount of phosphorus in them. The two poultry litters pretty much have similar phosphorus. 
And so we looked at the feather meal and the blend as a, nit as a way to get enough nitrogen, but reducing our phosphorus inputs. That was the thinking behind that. And you can see, though, that the cost of the plant available nitrogen, so how much nitrogen is available to your plant from each of these, is going to vary quite a bit. Not too surprising. <clears throat> In this experiment, we applied these materials at the rates that I'm showing here, the 40 pounds per acre of plant available nitrogen. <clears throat> we also had a control where we had no nitrogen applied, and we had ammonium nitrate at these various rates at zero, which, which is the control, 40, 80, 160, and 240. So that's a conventional fertility response curve. So we can look at the fertilizer equivalence value of these organic products, right? So if you can look at the amount of, we can do it this way. Now if you can look, you can look at yield and a typical nitrogen fertility response. So this is your nitrogen input rate or application rate. And typically you get like a, a response like this where this is corn grain yield, for instance. And I don't have, I don't have all these data shown up here, so glad to have this, uh, this whiteboard. You know, at a zero level, you can get some corn yield because <clears throat> there's nitrogen in the soil. And as you increase your rate, you'll plateau at some point. So uh, that's why we have this very high rate of 240 so that we can basically draw these curves. And then we can look at what our corn yield was in, let's say, the poultry litter application. Let's say it's that then we know that this is what the fertilizer equivalence value of that material is. Does that make sense? <clears throat> a lot of looks of, some looks of, yeah, I get it, but you can ask me about it later. The, I'm trying to explain to you why we have the ammonium nitrate in there. It's to put the, le the organic materials in the context of a traditional nitrogen fertility uh, program. <clears throat> okay. So we did this both, we applied all those materials and we did it in a, a field where we had some vetch and some we had no, no vetch as well. So we had the field divided into vetch and no vetch and we applied these materials by hand, <clears throat> which looks like a lot of fun, doesn't it? We did it both at pre-plant, which is what John, that's John Spargo delivering this stuff by hand right here. And we also did it at side dress, so when the corn was at about V5 to V6 or V8. <clears throat> <clears throat> and then we measured corn yield. And so that's what you see here. We did this in two years. You can see we're going back to 2009, 2010 at this point. There's a lot of numbers on there. Uh, if you, let's look at 2010 first. <clears throat> the black bars in both cases are the controls. That's where we have no nitrogen applied. Getting pretty decent yields. You can see I put at 10 megagrams per hectare. Sorry, this is all in... We have to go back and forth between international units and American units, you know, back when we give talks, and I forgot to do this till the last minute. So I just gave you 160 bushels per acre is 10 megagrams per hectare, just to put it in context in a way that you might understand a little better. <clears throat> so you see that in the control system, we're still getting a pretty decent yield, but in all cases, with all these materials applied at just 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre with no vetch, we're getting a yield boost, and the yield boost is no different among any of those products. So all these products are performing the same in 2010, right? If you look at 2009, pretty much the same, same results, except just a little complicated because pelletized poultry litter for some reason gives a little lower yield, but both years is pretty much the same, right? We're getting a yield boost from all these products, and the yield boost is about the same. <clears throat> and this is not, go ahead. Compared to our control, I mean. Compared to the black bar. Okay. That's what I meant. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, yeah, you're comparing no. volumes of the, of the nitrogen that you're getting from those things, not from like... Okay, so what I, what I meant by yield boost, so this is our control, right? So we have no nitrogen, and it's, it's not, it's not, well, it's not world-shattering news that when you add some nitrogen, you get more, a yield boost relative to this control. Applied at 40 pounds. So that's 40 pounds of each material. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. I, sh I forgot to put an N right there. Okay. So 40 pounds. If you remember from the earlier slide, these are all applied at 40 pounds of nitrogen. And that's to clarify. Remember, we added the ammonium nitrate at a bunch of different levels. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's at 40 pounds. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good point. 
Right, so basically the, the bottom line of this figure is these materials are pretty much behaving the same. We're getting a yield boost. This is with no vetch. So what happened with the vetch? Oh, well, let me show you this first, sorry. Uh, this again with no vetch, continuing 2009. Remember I told you we did this at pre-plant and we did it at side dress, the application of these different materials. So now I've got the different materials on the x-axis here and I just have the uh, organic materials. Brown bar pre-plant, green bar side dress. <clears throat> Turns out we actually got a 17 bushel per acre yield by applying these materials at side dress when you average all that. So that's kind of surprising because you know, who, who, who applies that poultry litter at side dress, anybody? Anybody even thought of doing that? Why would you even bother doing that? Well, maybe you can get some benefit. <clears throat> uh, and I also have on here, in case you're interested, the yield. Sorry, I can only show over here. I can't be two places at once. This is a yield with no nitrogen, which was 119 bushels per acre. And the highest yield we had with the fertilizer was, 100, was 184 bushels per acre. When we, applied the, when we did this calculation and came up with 143 as our nitrogen equivalent value. <clears throat> anyway, bottom line is, in 2009, we got a side dress benefit compared to pre-plant with these materials. Unfortunately, does anybody know John Spargo? I couldn't take a close up of him because he's crying here because that's a dead vetch field, more or less. <laughs> In 2009, the, the, the vetch that we planted in the fall pretty much died, very sparse, so we didn't really have a plus vetch control. All this, we did it all in the plus vetch, but the results are basically all the same as with no vetch. We essentially got no nitrogen benefit from our vetch. So I don't have any plus vetch data to show you from 2009, but in 2010, there's a lot of stuff on here, <clears throat> but this is similar graph with the pre-plant and side dress as we had before. But I have on the left with vetch, on the right without vetch. And I think I need to click on this. Okay, in general, when we average all our results from with vetch, without vetch, we did get a greater grain yield with vetch, which is not too surprising, right? And you can kind of see that if you look, scan it at the tops of the boys. The maximum yield at all our ammonium nitrate application rates with vetch was 210 bushels per acre. So that basically is telling us even with just 40 pounds of ammonium nitrate, this curve, this curve maxed out, well I guess I'll keep, let me keep it like this. Basically this was 40 pounds of ammonium nitrate fertilizer. In other words, if we added more than 40 pounds, we just didn't get more yield, we just maxed out. And so our yields with these organic fertilizers are essentially the same as with the, a fairly low rate of ammonium nitrate. So what does that tell you? That tells you you have quite a bit of residual nitrogen in your soil to begin with at this site, right? Because the crop is obviously doing very well, but we're not adding a whole heck of a lot of nitrogen. <clears throat> now that's with the vetch, so obviously the vetch is adding a fair amount of nitrogen, right? So it's the soil and the vetch itself. <clears throat> Uh, without vetch, we can get a higher yield with higher rates of ni ammonium nitrate fertilizer. We got our maximum yields. Without vetch, this number then would have been 106 pounds of ammonium nitrate. <clears throat> so we're obviously getting a nitrogen <clears throat> benefit from the vetch. Sorry about my uh, voice here. <clears throat> <clears throat> this year, however, we didn't see that side dress benefit except with our pelletized poultry litter without vetch. That's what that little, this little asterisk means here. So this side dress concept doesn't necessarily work every year. <clears throat> so summary from this first experiment is really that poultry litter is the preferred source for organic corn growth. All our materials had the similar performance, but the poultry litter costs less. Oh, I forgot to change this. this uh, does anybody know what $2.67 kilograms is in dollars per pound. It was, in the, it was in the first slide that I had. I forgot to change this one, but it's a dollar something, yeah. Um, so it's, but it's got, since poultry litter is the lowest cost, it doesn't really make that much sense to look at those more expensive materials for corn production. 
and the pea removal in the corn grain was about the same as the pea we applied in the poultry litter, and so you're balancing things out. So you're getting decent yields at relatively low poultry litter application rates, right? <clears throat> so in terms of source, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> So we got maximum corn yields when we had vetch plus poultry litter at this pea replacement level. So basically it's telling you that when you do have a good vetch crop, you can apply your poultry litter at relatively low levels. You're not hurting your corn crop and you're not adding too much phosphorus in the long term. <clears throat> and then finally the timing, just repeating that we did see a side dress benefit one of those years. <clears throat> so that's something, you know, something to just keep in mind to think about. The second experiment I want to talk to you about is an uh, experiment that we, where we took this concept and did it on form. And Marion, your form, even though we did work on it, is not here because you had alfalfa. So I'm just focusing on the annual cover crops here. But we did this at the Mason Heritage Forum in Cut Fresh Organics. And we also did it at Beltsville Ag Research Center. <clears throat> so this is the outline of the project. We had cover crops and poultry litters as our two things that we varied. The farmers could choose which cover crops they wanted, they, but they had to have one where they had no cover crops and one where they had two or three of these three legume cover crops, crimson clover, hairy vetch, or Austrian winter pea. Uh, Bill Mason hates hairy vetch, so he picked crimson clover and Austrian winter pea, for instance. <coughs> So we had the cover crop, and then we had three different poultry litter application rates, kind of asking the same question. Can we apply this poultry litter at a pea removal rate and not hurt our corn yields and not build up our soil phosphorus? So we had at these two rates at a nitrogen-based rate, a phosphorus-based rate, and no poultry litter. And again, we did this at planting and at side dress. At planting, we applied both the nitrogen and phosphorus levels, and at side dress, just the phosphorus-based rate. And I'm not going to show you all the, all the results because they all pretty much look the same. And uh, the cut fresh organic farm example shows you what we learned. <clears throat> Let's do it step by step here. If you look at no cover, <clears throat> so we had no cover crop. We don't get a great corn yield. This is a non-irrigated sandy site. Um, with no amendment, we get about half the corn yield as we do at any of the poultry litter application rates, whether it's nitrogen pre-plant, I mean nitrogen-based rate at pre-plant, phosphorus-based rate pre-plant, or phosphorus at side dress, we're basically getting the same corn yield. And so if, you have, if your cover crop doesn't work, you probably want to add some poultry litter, right? That's not too surprising. Both our vetch and our pea gave us more nitrogen than with no cover crop, obviously, so we had higher crop, corn yields there than we did with no cover crop. And then all those cases though, those little A's on top by the way mean that you know, there's no statistical difference among the boys. So that basically these yields are all the same whether we applied poultry litter at whatever rate at whatever time. So in other words we're getting enough nitrogen for corn for this one year and we have enough phosphorus in the system to give us this good corn yield. Bill Mason's farm is irrigated, He's essentially his, his yields are higher, but all the same pattern, indicating that maybe in some years we don't even need poultry litter, but if you don't have a cover crop, you definitely want to have yourself some poultry litter or some form of, of nutrients. So this was a little bit surprising to me. I was expecting that, um, I was expecting that we'd get a boost in yield from these organic materials in addition to what we got from the vetch, but that, or the cover crops, the legume cover crops, and in no case did we get that. So that was pretty interesting to me. What's limiting yield at this farm is probably just moisture, you know, just because it's a dry land, <coughs> sandyish soil, you don't get as much rain as you always want. But Bill's farm with the irrigation, same type of results, water's probably not limited. And so we're probably maxing out on what our corn yield is without even having to add these poultry litter products. 
So that, so that got us, oh. Somebody mentioned, Jenny mentioned PSNT this morning. Does anybody use PSNT in here? <clears throat> yeah, it's a great product, isn't it? <laughs> do you guys know what PSNT is? pre side dress nitrate test? It's probably a challenge to do it on a timely basis. Is that the limitation? We, we measure it as researchers. You know, we, we can use that. And in Maryland, the results show that if you're above 21 parts per million, you don't need to add any more nitrogen. You have plenty of nitrogen in your profile. If you're below 21, you want to think about adding some nitrogen source. But it doesn't recommend how much nitrogen to add based on whatever number you have. So it's kind of an all or nothing kind of decision tool. These sites, even though we basically got no nitrogen response, our PSNT was between 6 and 11 parts per million. So that's pretty low. And it says you really need to add more nitrogen. But our actual results show we don't need more nitrogen. And those PSNT samples were taken after we killed the cover crops, right? Because it's, you take the sample when the corn has been planted, after the corn's been planted. So, so PSNT actually did not turn out to be a useful tool to predict these results. That was a little not too satisfying because that is pretty much the only tool we have in Maryland to determine whether we have enough nitrogen or not. Michelle. Yes. Do you have any thought? I mean, that's, that's pretty radical to think that you wouldn't get any substantial difference if you didn't add the fertilizer, if you just used that cover crop. Did you do enough research to know how many years you might do that? That's, or the difference? that's experiment four. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I'll pay you later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, that's, and that's why I made the point that that was the results for that year. So you do have to think long term, and in organic systems, even more long term, because the phosphorus is building up from your poultry litter applications. If you're not applying any, it's going to go down, right? So, yeah, very good question. Although phosphorus leaves so slow. That's right. That's right. Is Changes really happen. What's that? It'll go down. We actually, in our long-term site, have seen some go down based on more conservative uh, application rates of poultry litter. But yes, it takes time. It's not an overnight thing. It's much easier to build it up than to... <clears throat> yeah. So, okay, so the summary from our second experiment is that corn yield was maximized with only cover crops or only poultry litter. We didn't get a boost when we combined the two. Um, and that was the same at, at three sites. All three of the cover crops performed equally well. I just showed you the two that uh, were used at this farm. But you know, when we used all three at Bark, we didn't see any difference. Uh, we use hairy vetch. We tend to use hairy vetch at Bark because uh, we're not concerned about the horrid seed. We've never really had a problem with it in small grains. Uh, but we use it because the literature generally shows that you get more nitrogen from hairy vetch than you do crimson clover. Well, our own research showing us that maybe that's not the case. <laughs> so these other cover crops are also obviously quite good at fixing nitrogen. Uh, corn yield was maximized at poultry litter when it was applied at the pea removal rate or lower. In other words, no poultry litter. Uh, and then finally, for timing, we found that there was no difference between applying the poultry litter at planting or at side dress. So at least we're not, lose, you know, we're not losing yield by applying it side dress. So the third experiment is, I'm just going to talk about the cover crop portion of this. So far, we've just talked about legumes. I mean, cover crops that are pure stands of legumes. And we heard Stephen Mursky this morning at the panel, at the science panel, talk about the combination of legumes and grasses. And some of the farmers spoke also. Does anybody use? Just a pure legume cover crop? Does anybody use a legume and grass cover crop mixture? OK, so yeah, so you guys ahead of us again. What, uh, well, you can tell me later. Uh, I'll ask you about planting rates or mixing rates. Um, but one thing that we found in the long-term experiment, as probably others have found, is that if we just use a pure legume, 
since most of the corn, since the corn is not really taking up a lot of nitrogen until about 30 days after planting, and you're killing your cover crop at planting, that nitrogen that gets released from hairy vetch or any pure legume is going to mineralize and could potentially be lost from the system before the corn's even taking it up, right? because of the carbon to nitrogen ratio of legumes is very narrow, so that nitrogen gets released very fast. So the nitrogen release from a legume cover crop is actually too fast. And so what if you add a grass to your legume, and you guys are already doing that, how much should you add? And what should your ratio be is the question. And how do you figure that out by looking at the nitrogen release from that and the nitrogen uptake by the succeeding corn crop in this case. And you looked at the difference in the nitrogen release in a no-till environment versus a conventionally tilled Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I, and I forgot to add here, this, not only is this a no-till, this time we're doing a no-till system, and this was not a pure organic system. We didn't have any nitrogen fertilizer. All our, ni all our nutrient inputs were organic. They were legumes and poultry litter. Uh, but we use some herbicides in the, during the corn growth phase. But the nitrogen release is still that fast, even in a no-till environment. It's still, it, it's a little slower than, than if you till it in, right? But it's still faster than you want it for corn, yeah. And I'll show you some data on that. This, this by the way, this is Stephen Mursky's experiment, driven by him, that we worked on together. But, so he designed this uh, seeding rate experiment <clears throat> where he, and I apologize, I, all, all the big bold numbers are in kilograms of seed per hectare. So I put down right below it what it is in pounds per acre. So there's a lot of numbers there. You can just ignore the bold numbers if you're not used to thinking in those units uh, and look at the pounds per acre. Um, so what Stephen devised then is an experiment where he had a hairy vetch monoculture, so no rye, but hairy vetch planted at 30 pounds per acre versus the other extreme with rye planted at 150 pounds per acre and no vetch. And then these mixtures in between, where you had 80% by weight of your seed planted is vetch and 20% rye. It actually doesn't work out to that at all, does it? But you, you get the idea, right? <laughs> yeah, how does that 80-20, Stephen? I don't know how that it ends up being 820, but, but the point is you got these, these, these ranges, and it's a wide range. A lot of people don't do this many treatments and experiment, and what this provides you, though, is this nice gradient where you can draw these curves, and because you have so many data points, you can interpolate, interpolate between your data points to, to fill in the gaps. L. Well, I have seen in the past and have understood a lot of things that don't And some folks, one piece I've read suggests you should count the number of seed per acre versus pounds because uh, clover will weigh less than, but you get more seed. Any, yeah. any work on that you're aware of? That's not my area. How's that? <laughs> I don't really know. I, no, I don't, I, I don't pay attention to that. I mean, I'm sure there's, yeah, that stuff goes, I can't, I mean, maybe. Right, right, right. But the weight of the, the number of seed in 10 pounds. Yeah, and that varies. Like for soybeans, you know, you do counts instead of weight. Yeah, there's, the seed size makes a huge difference. Right. In terms of research, I'm not familiar with the research on it. May, somebody else in the room maybe okay. knows more about that than I do. Put it on your list. I'm, there you go. <laughs> it's, on, it's, on the, it's on the TV. Um, you get the point, right? One, two, three, four, five, six different combinations from pure hairy vetch to pure rye and four combinations in between. So this is all planted in the fall, late September planting, where we're going to plant corn the following year. Then, here's a, here's a good data slide for you. So this is those ratios here, right? So this is um, no hairy vetch, but all rye. This is all hairy vetch and no rye, and the gradient in between. This is the nitrogen content, and I apologize, it's in kilograms per hectare, but kilograms per hectare and pounds per acre are, very, are pretty close. So let's look at the black line first. 
that's the ser ser that's the rye. <laughs> and so if you look at your left, zero to 100, you have more nitrogen in the rye when it's a pure rye stand. And as you decrease the amount of rye going to the right, there's less nitrogen in just the rye portion. So I know we cut samples of this stuff, put the rye in one pile, put the vetch in another pile, then measured the nitrogen in those. So there's less rye, so there's less nitrogen in the rye. Does that make sense? As you go, um, as you reduce the amount of rye in, in your mixture. That's the black line. The blue line is the hairy vetch. So at zero <coughs> on the left, we have zero hairy vetch and 100% rye. You basically have no nitrogen in hairy vetch because you don't have any hairy vetch. As you go to the right, you're increasing the amount of hairy vetch. The amount of nitrogen in hairy vetch is bigger because you have more hairy vetch. OK, does that make sense? So you got the black and the blue line. The red line is the combination of those two. So it's basically just adding them up. So if you look at the left, you'll see that the red and the black line match exactly because there is no vetch, right? And as you go to the right on the red line, you'll see that it goes up for a while, but then kind of plateaus, right? So really, at about 60 to 40, you've really plateaued. This red line, at this point, doesn't really go up anymore. It's pretty much maxed out. So at about 50-50, you're getting about as much total nitrogen in the cover crop mixture as you would with a 100% hairy vetch stand, right? So in other words, if you have half of your cover crop is rye, half is vetch, you don't get more nitrogen if you have 100% vetch. So you're getting as much nitrogen, but you're getting this rye cover crop mixed in, which is very beneficial because that's going to reduce the rate at which that nitrogen is released. It's, and this is a no-till system where all this stuff was rolled, so you're going to get better weed control because you have a thicker mat, because rye keeps weeds from germinating as a mulch better than vetch does. So with this mixture, we now know that you can get the same amount of nitrogen by having about a 60, 40, 40, 60, or 50, 50 mix, right? So that's good. This is a great slide, I think, in terms of, uh, <clears throat> this is the kind of slide you can only do when you have six different rates of these, of these types of things. And so the maximum, so in pounds per, in pounds per acre, this, this maxes out at about 150 pounds per acre, and you'll see it's 150 kilograms per hectare. It's about, it's about the same. So you get that rate, whether you have 50% vetch or 100% vetch. So that's total nitrogen, OK? That's what we're looking at. But we also want to know how that's going to behave. This is the carbon to nitrogen ratio in those same mixtures of cover crop now. Now we have the vetch and the rye combined. Grind it up, measure the amount of carbon, measure the amount of nitrogen. In a pure rye stand, your carbon to nitrogen ratio is maybe at about 60. This is, this is the average. So these are the complicated figures. But this, this, this dark bar in the middle is the average. This shows you kind of a range. This shows you a different range. Just look at the black bar in the middle. <laughs> we don't need to talk about all the variability, but if you want to ask about it, you certainly can. 60, a C to N ratio of 60, the yellow indicates that that's going to release slowly. The green and the light green in the middle, that's telling you that that's going to release slower than the yellow, but faster than, I'm sorry, faster than the yellow, sorry. Faster than the yellow and the dark green means it's going to get released really fast. This is the 100% vetch, carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's less than 20. 20 is kind of like this threshold. If your carbon to nitrogen ratio of anything that you put in the soil is less than 20, it's going to release the nitrogen very fast. So basically what we've done by doing this mixture is we've increased the C to N ratio where it's going to release at a reasonable rate but faster than pure rye. In pure rye, generally, what it'll do, instead of releasing the nitrogen, it'll actually take nitrogen from your soil and immobilize it. So that's what the yellow indicates in this graph. So what we've done with the mixture is we've gotten the benefits of the vetch with a relatively low nitrogen rate, but slowed down its release rate. And just to prove that to you, this is from a related experiment showing the release 
the decomposition rate of the different cover crop combinations. In this case, the rye is the doric line at the top, the hairy vetch is the bottom line, and the three lines in between are, in this case, combinations of 25-75, 50-50, and 75-25. So it's a different experiment using the same materials, put in little bags that you can measure decomposition rate. And so over time, your rye releases less, decomposes less than your hairy vetch, and your intermediate ones are intermediate. So it's a very straightforward kind of, hopefully. So this is actual days after termination, but if it's hot or cold during those days, that's going to affect the results. If the hotter it is, the quicker things are going to decompose, so that days by themselves are not the best way to measure this. But when you do growing degree days, you basically say, how many heating units was on day one? And I don't know, usually you use a base. so. You can use a base of 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And for every degree above that, for a given day, that's one going degree day. So it's a measure of how hot it was and the amount of time. It's combining those two, because that's a better measure of, of these types of, that's, that's really what drives this. It's not just a day, uh, all days are not equal. Right, does that make sense? Do you guys, do you guys use going degree days for any other things? Yeah, for like germination and, in corn, yeah. Yeah, okay. So. And then the y axis, um, is that of, of nitrogen? I'm, is yeah. Available or? Yeah, sorry. Thank you for asking these questions. Yeah, no, this is good. This is, percent, this is the proportion of mass remaining. So one means they had one unit. That's the, that's the 100%. Mm -hmm. So this is a percent of material. It's actually not nitrogen release exactly. So it's just the material. So basically what you do is you get, you get a little mesh bag, you put your stuff in your mesh bag, you put your mesh bag on the soil surface to mimic the real world. So that way you can pull your mesh bag out at these different time points and measure how much stuff is left. So that's like a surface, surface breakdown. It's a surface, yeah, because this is a no-till system, so we did it that way. Sometimes people do that, like in a tilled system, you can do these mesh bags and bury them. But it's a way of keeping all your stuff in one. You know, there's some artifacts of, of, of that method that the rates might be a little different than they are in real life. But the clarity, the distinction between these five different ratios is pretty clear in terms of the rate at which things decompose, right? So that after, at this time point for the rye, um, you still have, I can't see it quite well from here, but you, you have more than, more than 50, you have about 60% of your rye still remaining, right? For your vetch, you've got, you're down to about 20% of your stuff remaining, and it's already gone by here. So you can see that it just decomposes much faster. Does that make sense? Um, though you might have different rates of end fixation, can you expect the same release, curve release from different legumes, like peas instead of... Yeah, that, this, is largely, this is largely driven by that carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so it depends on what stage of growth your cover crop is. As it gets older and starts flowering, the carbon to nitrogen ratio goes up, and so that'll slow the decomposition rate down. So if we had peas in this instead of vetch, you could, you could expect the same kind of curve? Of Depends on, yeah, it, it would be similar, yes, yes. That would be very similar because the carbon nit nitrogen ratio of those three legumes is very similar. Yeah, at a, you know, at an equivalent growth stage. Very good question, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is applicable, this is kind of classic um, nutrient dynamics research that's been done with, diff with different types of materials. You know, if you put wood chips versus alfalfa in the soil and you watch them decompose, you know, the wood chips would be at the top and the alfalfa would be at the bottom. But people haven't really done this combined cover crop mixture stuff to do this. So Stephen, and Han Hannah, Hannah Poffenbarger, this is her master's work. <laughs> I saw, you saw the name earlier, probably, on one of the slides. Um, yeah, so, so the this is just decomposition, but it, it ties in closely to nitrogen release, too. If that material is decomposed, then the nitrogen's leaving it. So, so this is basically, you can read this in a couple ways. One is how, much, how quickly the stuff decomposes, 
but also, I mean, how, yeah, how quickly stuff decomposes, but it's also a uh, surrogate for nitrogen release. All right. One other point, you notice that 2012 and 2013, there's different rates, right? It's exactly the same experiment, exactly the same stuff, but the season was slightly different. So there are differences uh, from year to year, which is one of the challenges in organic, right, is to get this synchrony of nutrient release from organic materials in the way you want it to happen. It's all driven by biology, so we're not living by chemistry alone here. Okay, finally, one more experiment. How are we doing on time? What, what time? What's my... I forgot to ask. <laughs> what time is am I supposed to stop talking? <laughs> yeah, I'm the last one, so... Who bought the beer? <laughs> um, this, okay, so this is the last experiment. So this is addressing Marion's question. You know, we know that in some years at least, and in sites that have fairly high soil nitrogen, because of previous management, that we can get by with maybe either just a cover crop or applying a, a legume cover crop, or a legume cover crop with poultry litter applied at a P removal rate for corn, right? Okay, that's good for one year, but what about the year after? And the year after, if you, how long can you keep that reduction going? Or at what point does the fact that you didn't add nitrogen and phosphorus and poultry litter in year one affect you in year two or three? Because these nutrients don't all disappear, right? They're still there. If they haven't been taken up by the crop, a lot of them are still there to be taken up later. <coughs> if you don't add them, you might start draining your system. And so now I'm coming back to this long-term project that is what I spend most of my time doing. We've been do managing these organically at these somewhat conservative poultry litter application rates for 20 years. And we realized we probably have too much nitrogen, too much phosphorus, remember one of my first slides. And so we said, well, let's stop applying poultry litter in a small microplot in these large plots that we have and see what the response is to corn year one and then look at soybean year two. We can also look at the rye and wheat year three and in the six year rotation, look at the alfalfa. We started this last year and so I'm just reminding you with these other three systems we have <clears throat> and there's a reason I put the yellow indicates where we apply the poultry litter for the corn and for the wheat. And the, I put vetch and rye in blue because when we started this experiment, we just had this, the pure vetch. And from Stephen's work, we learned we should really be mixing our vetch with rye. You guys are ahead of us. You've been doing it for years, probably. We just learned this a few years ago, so we now have this vetch-rye mixture. So this experiment now is, it, we're back to tilled systems. But now we have a vetch plus rye mixture, and we're going to reduce our poultry litter applications. All our previous poultry litter studies were with pure legume stands, so now we're doing the mixture within the context of these mature organic systems that have been around for about 20 years. So these are the treatments we used. Um, Hopefully this lingo makes sense, and I didn't organize the slide super well. But we established microplots within our full plots of the experiment. We did a 1x poultry litter, managed weed-free. So what does that mean? That means we did our typical weed management in our organic systems. Sometimes you might know, as you might know, that some weeds don't get killed during all that process. So we had an army of people go out there and hand weed so that we didn't have this weeds interfering with our understanding of poultry litter. But as Marion's husband has told me many times, on organic farms, we have weeds, sometimes. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> and so we also did this in a microplot that is weedy, that we maintained that whatever weed population we had after we did our rotary hoeing and cultivating. So that's our standard treatment, one weed free and one weedy. And then we we'll ramp down our uh, poultry litter application rate to two-thirds, one-third of the, of the typical rate, and then it's the zero poultry litter. So this is, again, similar type of design where we have different poultry litter application rates. We grow our cover crops like we normally do. 
we maintain this range weed free, but both our 1x and our 0x rates, we keep it at whatever weed pressure we had that year. Because the weeds also take up nitrogen, right? And so you have to factor that in. Well, it turns out that in our two year organic system, our poultry litter application rate last year was 2.5 tons per acre. Because if you remember, that rotation is corn, rye, soybean, vetch plus rye. We didn't harvest our soybeans last year till November 11th, I think, because of wet conditions. Well, what happens when you plant a vetch plus rye mixture in November? How big is it in, say, mulch? Like this, if you can find a plant, right? <laughs> so in other words, uh, we had a failure of our cover crop. So because of that, we added, this is essentially just a poultry litter experiment in the two-year organic rotation. Our three-year rotation and our six-year rotation both had good cover crops. So we added our standard poultry litter application rate is just 1.5 tons per acre. So when you, when you see later on, we see 1x, 0.6x, 7x, 0.33x, those are going to differ for the Oig 2 versus the Oig 3 and Oig 6. Just keep that in mind. OK, so here's a whole bunch of data, because that's what we do, throw data at you guys. I was expecting a bigger screen that I could walk up to. <laughs> so OK, a lot of stuff up there. I do have bushels per acre for you, at least, for corn grain yield. I got my, the two weedy plots are over on this side. OK, so this is maybe your standard organic form with 0x and 1x poultry litter. And then we have the range 0.3, 0 0.67, and 1 uh, with weed free. So let's look at our weed free first, if you don't mind. NS means, does anybody know what NS means? Not significant. This is the results of the statistical analysis we did on this. If it says NS here, that means these four are all the same. So what do you see in both the OIG2 at the top and OIG6 at the bottom? No significant difference. In other words, our corn yield is the same whether we apply poultry litter at this 1x rate, any lower rate, or even at zero rate. So this is year one. But your question is still hanging, Marion, because year two is 2018. So I don't know the answer yet. But that's what we're going to do, is we're going to follow this for years to see what happens. Um, you'll notice that in our weed-free system, organic free, we did get a loss of yield at 0x poultry litter compared to 1x. That's what the A versus B means. The AB means that these two are not different than either of those two. So this is the only statistical difference there. And I can't remember how many bushels it is, but we are losing um, some yield by not putting some poultry litter on. But not in the two-year or not in the six-year rotation. OK, now let's go back over to the weedy. We have 0 and 1x. Weedy, none of our systems showed any difference even with weeds between these two extreme values. That surprised me. Um, but that's the results. Finally, you see on the top in OIG2, I have a bunch of letters on top of the boys to explain the results from the statistical analysis. And if you look at the capital A versus the capital B, that means those two are different. So what does that mean? That means that the weeds, this is weed free, and this is weedy. So weeds definitely had an impact. So in other words, corn yield, with our typical poultry litter application, with weeds is lower than without weeds. Might not surprise you, right? But that's not the case in these two systems. Only in the short organic two-year rotation. Why is that? It's because we actually have more weeds. So there's more weed competition in our two-year rotation. This is something we find year in and year out almost all the time. Our shorter rotations are weedier than our longer rotations. And I've talked about that in the past, but our two-year rotation, it's corn one year, it's soybean the next year. Corn, soybean, corn, soybean, corn. Your weeds are, gonna, are always competing against a summer annual. Your time to kill weeds is always the same time. Your weed types might evolve a little bit over time, but you don't have a wheat crop in there, for instance, to break that weed cycle. Once you add wheat, you reduce your weeds. Once you add alfalfa, 
Now you're cutting your crop three to five times a year. Any weeds that are gonna survive in a corn soybean rotation aren't gonna survive in that alfalfa. In fact, when we come back to corn after the alfalfa, we find we have grass weeds Whereas in our shorter systems, we have the broadleafs, you know, like pigweed, uh, kinopodium, what do you call that, lamb's quarters. And so the weeds are very different. But we also have the longer, more complicated rotation, we have fewer weeds. And we typically have most weeds here. And you see that effect here in this experiment where we just have higher corn grain yield if we get rid of all our weeds. That's pretty straightforward. But we also have a difference here at the 0x level compared to that 0x. In other words, we're adding no poultry litter, and we have no weeds here and weeds there, and it's the same story that we just have some weed damage, weed, weed uh, yield reduction due to weeds. <clears throat> so this overall, though, says that, suggests that probably we can lower our poultry litter application rate in all these systems, right? Because we're not seeing a big difference, at least in year one, for our corn, corn crop. We'll see what happens with our soybean crop, because if we're drawing down our phosphorus rate, that could hit our soybeans. Soybeans are gonna fix nitrogen, so we don't have to worry about the nitrogen side, but then we come back to wheat, and wheat's gonna need both the nitrogen and the phosphorus, right? So we'll see what, what happens. So that's kind of our long-term, uh, applying this concept to the long-term system. That's really where the title of the talk comes from. Um, but my sense so far, and this is for silt loam soils, you know, a lot of you guys probably have more sandier soils, so you want to factor that in. I really need to do some of this work on a sandier soil to see how much of this retention of poultry litter we have from year to year, because you probably have a little less. So you might have less flexibility with reducing your poultry litter on a sandier soil. So keep that in mind. Why do you think you had no yield, a uh, yield response in the sh three year? Uh, yeah, between here and here. On the, on the far right compared to the long, uh, this long one. rotation with the same amount of, with the 1x. Yeah. Um, why, why would, you would almost assume you'd see more of a yield response with a longer rotation, or I don't know, but I just would assume with the same amount of. Yeah. Why, why do you think? I'm not sure yet. Three I'm not sure. These yields are not that different. Okay. You know, and, you know, when you do statistical analyses, I mean, this, you can see that this, this mean here is higher than that mean there, right? Um, well, I was comparing the B in, in the, that to the one below. Oh, to this one. Yeah. Oh, why, yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what do you think? Yeah, those, that one is taller than that. Uh, it's not statistically different, I don't think. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I actually put these d numbers together just earlier this week. I haven't thought it through completely, but yeah, it's one of the questions. Because we often get a higher corn yield here than here. Just, yeah. yeah, historically we've gotten, we've tended to get higher here. But this is weed free, and traditionally we get a higher yield here than here, where we have some weeds possibly, be just because we have fewer weeds down here. So usually it's a weed driven thing. This is new to me, where we got rid of the weeds but we don't, so we've collected a lot of other data that I haven't looked at yet. One is weed biomass, which is irrelevant here because it's weed free, but we collect uh, nit nitrogen phosphorus uptake by the crop. We have some data on nitrogen uptake and soil nitrogen during the season, that that could help explain some of these differences. Uh, and we have some other data that, that might help explain this. So I don't, yeah, I don't know, it's a good question. Um, so that's year one. We'll have to find out what happens in year two. Um, finally, the conclusion is, at the beginning, I showed you a slide with the cover crop and the manure. Well, what's become really critical is to be able to measure the amount of nitrogen released from the soil itself, right? And this is what that PSNT is supposed to do, and it didn't do a good job on our experiments. So we're testing out a few other methods soil quality measures that might be more tied to that, that we're doing, that we're do, doing back here that maybe could help explain some of that. Uh, so yeah, so we don't know yet. But bottom line, I mean, this is what organic farming is all about. It's to build this up, right? It's to build up the organic matter in your soil and that that serves 
as an important reservoir of nutrients, which takes some time to build up. But once you've built it up, we really don't have a great handle on how to manage that in the long term. And that's what we're trying to do in this long term system trial is we know we probably have too much nitrogen and phosphorus, so what is the right, what's the soft sp sweet spot where we can up reduce rates but still not lose yield? And all the other, yeah, just there you go, PSNT was not always a good measure. The other conclusions I've already made, so this could be, really could be the last slide of the talk, but the final conclusion is that this approach to the four R's of nutrient management can also be used with organic materials, not just synthetic fertilizers. <clears throat> Having said all that, if any of you are interested in providing us some support letters for this new grant, we're writing a new grant to look at, actually to look at, to help it answer your question too, where we're sampling our soil in much uh, much more intense way with a soil microbiologist from University of Maryland to look at what we call gross mineralization and gross nitrification. We have to use isotopes to do this stuff and to look at the soil microbial community to see if any of that can explain differences we see. So. Anyway, if you're, if you're interested in uh, providing us some support letters, I actually have drafts in here that you can fill out. <laughs> That's the end of my talk. Any other questions or comments? Or? Yes? Well, you can, you can. Thanks, sir. <laughs> this is really a nice question because this is your area of expertise, not related to this cropping system. Do you know much about compost and its and release of PE to compost? And, and, and is there any reason a vegetable farmer should be worried about how much um, compost should be applied to a field? For the very same reasons as this, yeah. When I first took this project over, there was actually, we have five cropping systems I mentioned, the long-term cropping. Uh -huh. We had seven systems, and one of them was compost-based. Uh -huh. And I got rid of that one because it didn't make any sense to me because compost generally has less nitrogen than, um, than straight manure, than whatever the source the compost was made out of because you lose nitrogen during the decomposition process, uh -huh. but you don't lose any phosphorus. So when you're adding compost, it's a better, it's the phosphorus, the, there's more phosphorus per unit of nitrogen, and so that can compound your problem. So we don't use compost at this site at all. I mean, we're field crops, so you tend not to use compost as much anyway, but you're right, in vegetables you do, right? So you do want to keep an eye on your soil phosphorus levels. Well, if our soil organic matter is so right. I mean, I know we have a nutrient management plan that we're working with, but are there any general rules about rates of application that we should be aware of? Know what your soil levels are to begin with of phosphorus. Know what the applicate, what's in the stuff you're applying, right? Uh -huh. You have to know both of those, and you need that for your nutrient management plan anyway, right? And so you can also estimate how much phosphorus you're going to take off in your vegetables. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to measure it in your actual vegetables, but there's tables on the web somewhere, the extensions put out somewhere. So you can, ex you can estimate how much phosphorus you're going to take off each year, and you know how much you're putting in if you measure your compost, and you don't want your in to be a lot more than your out, mm -hmm. right? Depending on what your soil phosphorus level is. If your soil phosphorus level is low, then you do want more in than out, ours, right? We have different pots and ours is kind of all the Exactly, right, right, right. That's standard, yeah. But we did have a certain rate we wanted to apply it to all the farm for, for organic matter buildup, but so you can, you, you, did you measure your organic matter in your soil as well? Because, yeah, so you, you, you want to factor all these things in. So you might have a field, I mean, in our case, sometimes the two go together where the history of our research site, it's next to a dairy. So it had dairy manure applied to it over the years. And in those, those portions of the field, we tend to have high phosphorus and high organic matter. So sometimes, Previous history already gave you what you want in terms of organic matter. But if you know that you want to build up organic matter, then yes, compost is probably the best way to do it in that the, the carbon, the, the organic matter in the compost has already been decomposed, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be more stable. It's not going to decompose as quickly. Uh -huh. If you have a sand, do you have a sandy soil? Uh, we have a Yeah, so your sandy loam is probably going to, there's, there's, each soil has, it's kind of, 
Yeah, that doesn't help me. <laughs> I'm a soil scientist, but it still doesn't help me. Uh, any soil type has a max, has really a plateau is how much carbon it can hold to begin with, or organic matter it can hold. And so that, a sandy soil just cannot hold carbon as well as a soil with more clay. Because the organic matter actually physically and chemically binds to the clay particles. Sand just doesn't do it. It just, there's no way for the organic matter to stick. So, it, so you have to think, so if you have beach sand, then it's very difficult. But most people don't have beach sand. Some people in Maryland do, right? But you, you often have some clay. And you want to set your soil organic matter goal realistically based on your soil type. That's step one. So see where you're at. Yeah, where do you find? Has anybody seen that type of a table? You know, like soil texture versus carbon pot potential organic matter? I don't know if I've seen that, but there must be that. There must be somewhere. And then, so figure out what's realistic for your soil type for your organic matter. If you have a very sandy soil and you're pretty close to max, adding more compost, it's just not going to stay there. And so, but you could be, you know, way off. So figure that out first. And then do this phosphorus balance, which will be part of your nutrient management plan. And also, this will all depend on your soil type with depth too, right? Some soils are fairly sandy up top, but then have clay down below. That's gonna lose your core. That's, you can actually use that clay down low to hold on to that carbon too. So you have to factor all that in. Does that help? Does anybody else have any comments that I'm skipping, something I'm forgetting to say? I, I, don't, I don't do this kind of consultation, so I don't think about it from this perspective. Would, but, you, would you say that using Horse manure plus leaves would be better and have less heat. The compost? Yeah. Is that worse? The horse manure you're going to get is going to have shavings in it. Yeah. So you're 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 going to have a lot of carbon and very little N. Yeah. Very little N because it has P. Though. Oh, very little because the yeah. shavings have almost no P. Yeah. And the horse manure you have. Oh God, I think I did the recent once and checked the average. It's. We've all, yeah. Very little, yeah. very, very little in in the right. horse manure because right. the, the shavings are, are most of it. But then. And the horse manure, even by itself, has less in than right. cow manure, too. And, so. and if you're using leaves, what kind of leaves are you going to use? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I and, just what the best method is for building up organic matter. Oh. What I found when I had my place was cover crop, cover crop. Thank you. That's what I forgot to say. Sing it again. That's what. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. The other thing is, if you want to build up your, cover, your organic matter fast, you can't. You can, Go ahead. What you can do is, and it's tedious, I don't know how, much, how many feet of, row feet of bed you have, is in your planting hole, put in compost. Yeah, that, we actually do that in our garden too, yeah. But you can get more uh, um, holding capacity right where the plant is. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Bed. Yeah, yeah. And it costs you less. And for vegetables, that's doable. If, yeah. if you have widely spaced vegetables versus carrots or something like that. Okay. Or you can even put it in the low if you're doing carrots. Yeah. If you're, you know, yeah. that's, if you're doing carrots, you take the hole, yeah. open it up, put it in, yeah. and you plant the carrots or beets or, you know, any of your small things in the farrow. Yeah. And on top of that, so phosphorus doesn't move in soil too much. Right. This is what I learned when I went to school in Kansas, but then I moved to Maryland, and it's like phosphorus does move because you got so much damn phosphorus <laughs> that... It breaks the rules, but um, but phosphorus generally doesn't move in soil, so the roots have to go get it. Right. So the phosphorus that is in your compost with this method, you're growing the roots right there, so the crop will actually have better access to the phosphorus than if you spread it out everywhere. Um, you're going to head out looking for the end. You're not going that's right. That's right. They won't stay constrained. Won't stay constrained. Yeah. Um, but cover crops, plants, all, all carbon in your soil, all the carbon in everybody's soil, where did it come from to begin with? Except for caliche, which is a whole other issue, but unless it's calcium carbonate, all that carbon came from the atmosphere at some point through photosynthesis. If you're putting manure on, there's carbon in that manure because some plant took it out of the atmosphere previously and the cow ate it, right? So all that carbon came from photosynthesis. That's the best way to build up carbon. 
And you want to do that over the long term, no matter what you do, to kind of jumpstart things with a compost type thing. The other thing is if you think about, if you're doing this compost to really jumpstart things to get your organic matter up high, you can get by by doing that just once, you know, and then focus on the cover crops to add more carbon and to not add new the phosphorus. The thing I would suggest when I have my place is consistent cover crop, as I asked Michelle earlier, is between, if you plant peas and you're coming back with, uh, say, cabbage in the fall, put a cover crop in between the If you have time, peas. yeah. I mean, even if you have two inches or three inches, that's more carbon than you had before. Plus your roots, and a living root system is different than just adding compost, too. Yes. Because you have, that living root is releasing carbon, that carbon is being fed on by bacteria and fungi, and it makes a difference. So, yeah. Um, on those plots, they were all, no, was that crimps, no-till, you said? That was only for the cover crop portion. Okay. Only for that experiment three. So, would you see a difference, like if you're doing tillage yeah. in an organic system, that solubility, does that change, is it quicker if you're doing tillage? The, that decomposition rate? Yeah. Yes, organic that'll be, yes. Yes, that'll be even quicker. It'll, the, the steepness of the curve at the beginning will be quicker, yeah. So most That's likely, right. if you're doing tillage, you might, you could be missing out on the potential <coughs> of, your, of your cover crop. Yeah, like, yeah. Most likely the corn's not getting it, probably. Yeah, so. that's, that's basically our concern in our yeah. long-term system, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're going to lose, I mean, some of it. It's, <coughs> what proportion, I don't really know, but that's some of the soil sampling we're doing more intensively that. Are you doing any experiments with tillage? With and without type of thing? Or? Yeah. Stephen does a lot more of that type of stuff, yeah. yeah. But he's done a fair amount of till, no-till. He's spent a lot of time trying to make no-till organic work, yep. and his large conclusion is a, a good, tall, rye cover crop, you can plant an organic soybean into that with some success. Yeah. A no-till legume or legume grass mixture, planting corn into that, much more difficult. Yeah. So that if you're going to try to reduce your tillage in an organic system, try to do it in that soybean phase, you know, maybe peas or something like that. Uh, small grain is harder because um, somebody mentioned, somebody asked something about, about the garlic and the wheat. And I asked, oh, yeah. then I asked somebody else about what are the constraints to putting in a small grain here on the eastern shore. And the first response was the garlic. And we had that at FSP, at the Farming Systems Project, the first years I was there. And I just used to just make jokes, well then let's just make garlic bread with it. That's no problem, but that's just a joke, right? And now we don't have it anymore, and I don't really know why that is. But we did, rotations. no, we haven't changed the rotations. We didn't change the rotations much. <laughs> the three-year rotation we didn't change at all. And uh, what we did do, though, is we were do, tying some of this reduced tillage in those early years, and I think it was because of that that we had this, but we use a moldboard plow still, <coughs> at least before the corn, not before soybeans, but I think that helps bury some of that stuff. But, you know, every location's different, so I'm not making that. I, I never had wild garlic, but from what I understand, a lot of the guys, it's your timing. If that seed head swells, you're done. Yeah. No, it was, uh, yeah, it was in the wheat, there's no doubt. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't, I'm not a weed scientist, but, no. Do you guys have no, no place to go or what? <laughs> Thank you all.